So we've talked quite a bit about the electric potential now and thought about what it is near a point charge and how to calculate it and where to put the infinity. Now let's do the potential near continuous charges. So just about like with the electric field, we think about a smoothly charged object. We treat it as a continuum with some charge density. So we thought about the electric field for that. Let's think about the potential. So let's start with the same one. Let's start with my charged rod with some charge density lambda. Okay? And it was length L. And before, we said it would be good to set up the coordinate system where we have the rod on the x-axis, like that. And we'll put the center of the rod at the origin, here. Some charge density lambda. And we want to know what is the potential at some point um, up from the center. We can call that the y-axis and put the point right there, point P. And it's at some height above the center A. Okay. So how do we get the potential? Just like with the electric field, we don't have a formula for a rod. We have a formula for a point. So we do the same thing. We break the rod up, and we think about some little piece of the rod like this. And we call that little piece to have a charge dq. And if you want to know what dq is in terms of x, we know that it's lambda times that little piece dx. So we're going to write the differential potential. What little uh, amount of potential does this create here? And now we can treat this as a point charge, and it's at some radius away. So it's at this distance like that. So we say, OK, then the little piece of potential it's creating, we'll call it a differential potential, dv. And then we think back, well, what's our formula for the point charge? It was k e Coulomb's constant. The charge is dq over r. So no integral to worry about. We've already done all that. This is basically just the potential of a point charge, kq over r. All right. Well, now we just have to add that up for all along the rod right, to get the v. All right, the potential is the integral. Add up all the dvs, which means we need to integrate uh, this thing. So we have ke here. We need to actually integrate along an axis. So we'll switch dq. Uh, we'll switch dq to lambda dx, like that, because we know we're going to add up every little piece going along the charged rod. We're going to integrate the whole rod, so we're going to go from minus L over 2 to L over 2. And we know that uh, everything in the integral has to be as a function of x, anything that changes. Well, this distance that we would usually call r, actually, we need to figure out what it is. Well, we have a right triangle here. It's the square root of x squared plus a squared. a is the height. x is where you are. And we're just lucky that it doesn't matter when x is negative because it's squared. So it works for both the positive and negative side of x. So down here, we have the square root of x squared plus a squared. So that's it. We just have to do that integral. And this is one that we can't just do by hand. It's one that you got to do some complicated method, or you just look it up in a table. Right? You can't do it by hand. You could say, well, it's x squared plus a squared to the minus 1 half, and you divide, raise it to 1 half, and divide. But that won't work, because you got the de derivative of this is 2x. And when you try to divide by that, there's no x to cancel it out. So we can't do it. So we will look it up. and in the table. So we'll say, let's see, so v, let's take all the constants out that we can, ke uh, lambda. And we're left with the integral of dx over the square root of x squared plus a squared. So I look it up, and it's sort of a complicated one. It's actually the natural logarithm in ln. I'm sure you've heard of the natural logarithm. And uh, now I've got I've to confess something that the worst thing about teaching a class, especially to this number of people, is you're always very insecure about how you say things. Right? So you have some word 
or a name that you say a certain way, and it's because your teacher taught you that way. And you hope all your teachers said it the right way because it would be very embarrassing, right, to say it the wrong way. Um, so one for me is the natural logarithm. I was raised to call it lawn, like mow your lawn, right? Log was base 10, but the natural one is lawn. So I'm just gonna call it lawn. I was gonna try to convince myself to say natural logarithm every time so I wouldn't potentially be embarrassed. But I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna do it my way, I'm gonna say lawn. I hope someone else in the world says lawn other than Mr. Reed, my seventh grade geometry teacher. Okay, so it's uh, Ke, uh, Coulomb's constant, times charge density, linear charge density lambda, times the ln of x plus square root of x squared plus a squared from the table. If you don't believe me, take the derivative of that, see if you get back to there. I strongly encourage you to, to do stuff like that. Minus L over 2 evaluated from minus L over 2 to L over 2. And now it just really comes down to plugging in. We will get that uh, the potential V is Ke lambda. And it's the ln of this with L over 2 minus the ln of this with minus L over 2. And you know that when you have sort of the, uh, anytime you have a log of A minus a log of B, it's the log of the ratio. Right? So that's also true for natural logarithms. So we can start writing it as the ratio right away. We plug in this, it's L over 2 plus the square root of L squared over 4 plus A squared. And minus, so it goes in the denominator, minus L over 2 plus the square root. And the minus also squares to L squared over 4 plus A squared, like that. You could go from there. You could uh, simplify some more. You can multiply the top and the bottom by 2 if you want to. Let's just do that, and then we'll call it quits. Ke lambda ln uh, top and bottom by 2. That becomes L plus, take the 2 in there, and it cancels that 4. That's convenient. Uh, L squared plus 4a squared over minus L plus the square root of L squared plus 4a squared. You could try to simplify it more, but you're not really going to do much. Okay. It's, it's always going to look ugly. But that is the potential here. So in principle, it was very simple. It was very similar to uh, doing it for the electric field. But in practice, it was a lot easier. Because remember, the potential is a scalar field. We didn't have to think about vectors. We didn't have to do an i component, uh, i hat component, and a j, a j hat component, and think about the cosine and all that stuff. It's just a potential. One term, and we're done. Uh, we have a question here. Let me see. Uh, I'll break the board. Uh, let's see. Andrea, plan B again. Does it need to be symmetric like that? Oh, yes. Uh, let's see. So what we're asking here, yes, yeah, so I did this in the center, right at this point, right up, up the center of the rod. And we were thinking about the electric field. We put it there on purpose to make all the x components cancel so it would just stick straight up. And that let us only do one term. So that was one reason we needed symmetry. Sometimes symmetry makes a problem easier. Sometimes symmetry is required to even do a problem. In these Gauss's law problems, to be able to do the vector calculus without a great deal of difficulty, we like symmetric situations. Here, you don't need symmetry. I just happened to put it there. If we did nothing here that requires symmetry, you could just as easily have put it here at the end of the rod. We could calculate it there with these similar formulas. We could calculate it here or here or anywhere. All it would really do in the way we set this up is affect your limits. You could calculate it right here, call this the origin, and then you would integrate from 0 to L. And most of the problem would all, all be the same, except for evaluating, uh, applying limits to the integral. Or you could do it at this point and call this the origin, and it will also affect the limits of your integral. So yeah, symmetry is not critical in this uh, exact case.